Cyberpunk 2077's original release has to be one of the most tumultuous launches of all time. Here you had a game that was highly anticipated for the better part of like half a decade, coming from the much loved and respected CD Projekt Red, only to be launched in an outright unfinished state, being more or less unplayable on certain platforms. Hey, get back to the Panzer! We don't have time! Maybe it was just a little bit too ambitious from the get-go, which probably played a part in why it didn't hit all its marks when it first released, but credit where credit is due, they definitely didn't give up on it. How's that been working out for you? And over the years, CD Projekt Red have kept coming back and refining the whole thing, to the point that it's finally hit 2.0, the long-awaited update, which more or less completely overhauls some of the key mechanics, to the extent that it really does feel entirely different and much more like what I'm sure they'd originally intended to release in the first place. Not only does this new update change a lot of the fundamentals to how the game plays, but it also adds an entirely new Phantom Liberty DLC, if you're willing to pay extra, which comes with a completely new area of Night City, along with new main and side missions, weapons, items, and collectibles. This your iron? Starring old mate Idris Elba as a new key figure, and at this point all Cyberpunk is missing is Mike O'Hearn as a supporting character to be as fully relevant as possible. What is love? Baby, don't hurt. Well, seeing as it's been almost three years since I last did a video on this thing, yeah, three years, I thought it might be worth going back and taking a look at this new and improved edition. And no further proof of how good 2023 in gaming has been is the fact that this is the year they finally managed to turn Cyberpunk 2077 around. Yeah, there's never been a better time to get a bit of CP. FBI, open up! So wake the fuck up, Samurai. We've got a game to review. I see. And appreciate both the honesty and the metaphor. Right, so before I get too far into the review, I do have to take a moment to thank this video sponsor, Manscaped. Manscaped is a trusted brand used by more than 9 million men worldwide, known for their trimmers, liquid formulations, and premium boxes. Their latest product is the Lawn Mower 4.0, an electric trimmer that features a cutting edge ceramic blade designed to reduce accidents, along with an LED spotlight to help you make those more delicate movements. There's a cordless charging system, which even has up to 90 minutes of battery time. But I gotta say, if you're spending more than 90 minutes getting all of that done, well, I think you might want to look at hiring in some help. Even better than that, it's waterproof, which means it can be used in the shower or even outside during the middle of a rainstorm, though I'd probably advise against the latter. They've also got some really other useful products as well, like the 7000 RPM Weed Whacker, a nose and ear hair trimmer, along with deodorants, sprays, anti-chafing boxes, and a handy travel bag. They even throw all of these in with the Performance Package 4.0 as free gifts. So head on over to manscaped.com to get 20% off your next order, plus free international shipping with the promo code GMAN. Yeah, that's right, 20% off your order, plus free shipping with the promo code GMAN, only at manscaped.com. Now, I don't think anyone really needs me to run through what Cyberpunk is all about at this point. Briefly, though, it's a game set in the not-too-distant future where you're playing as a character named V, choosing from one of three different backgrounds and an insurmountable amount of appearance options before being unleashed into the dystopic Night City. The original plot lines about V stealing a relic from the Arasaka Corporation, which pairs him up with the digital ghost of a war veteran named Johnny Silverhand, played by Keanu Reeves, with the end goal being to find a way to deal with Johnny's presence, and problems aside, it was a decent enough story in that regard. You woke up in a landfill, I woke up in your head. That was, however, three long years ago, and while the basic plot is obviously still the same, the means in which you get through it have changed quite a bit with this new update. Now, I'm not going to rattle off every single change and update they've added in, firstly because it's kind of boring, but secondly because I still haven't even experienced all of it. Either way, though, there's definitely some changes and updates that are worth mentioning. The first one that I really started to appreciate was the way they've restructured the way the police come after you. So again, you start out at a lowly one star, with it again building up incrementally with the more carnage you keep causing. Hop into a car though and try to flee the scene, and these guys are even going to give chase in whatever vehicle they've got, which was something that was sorely lacking from that launch version. 
and it's kind of crazy to think that this was completely absent with the game's launch. Technically, that meant that even an older ass game like GTA 3, something released way back in 2001, had more advanced law enforcement mechanics than a 2020 game did. In fact, now if you piss them off enough, they'll even send in max tack, at which point it's pretty much just game over, man. Game over. <laughs> Nevertheless, it's nice that the men and women in blue finally have an actual presence in Night City. Plus, this also ties into the new vehicle combat as well, how you can now fire weapons while driving, useful for shooting at pursuing vehicles. Plus, you can even buy different cars now with weapons already equipped. It's not quite full Mad Max mode though, and you won't be taking on convoys of inbred bandits or anything like that, but it's a fun addition which is just another element of customization and another extra layer of gameplay. Another new thing is that they've totally changed how clothing and armor work. Because now, armor comes from your equipped cyberware and not your clothes, which is a pretty damn massive change. In fact, the first time I loaded back into my now three-year-old save file, my character was completely butt naked, and not because I left that that way on purpose, but because all of those bits of clothing I'd crafted just didn't exist in the game anymore. That means the days of having these overpowered, game-breaking outfits is gone, replaced with a much more sensible and limited approach to buffing up your character. But it's actually kind of awesome as well, because now you can dress the way you want to, and not look like fucking Joe Exotic just to try to get the best possible stats. Guess what, motherfucker? Aside from that, they've also completely reworked the stamina, with stamina now being infinite when sprinting, and instead drained when you're using weapons. And as someone who absolutely hates it, where you can only sprint for 10 seconds in video games before having to catch your breath, this right here is easily one of my favorite changes. Plus, I just think that the concept of stamina dropping when you're using weapons makes a lot more sense, given that the lower your stamina gets, the more it affects your combat effectiveness. What's also kind of interesting too is that you've now got infinite healing items and grenades, and now instead of crafting them, they all operate off cooldowns. And this does sound a bit weird at first, but again, I think it's actually a pretty sensible change, because it prevents players from spamming grenades or healing items during combat. Just feels like it makes your combat choices have a lot more weight, and you can't just autopilot your way through encounters. And in fact, that's really the overall vibe I get from 2.0, is that you're not just able to half-ass your character's playstyle. Good for you. I've seen a lot of people online already bitching about how they've reworked the skill trees in that regard, which I gotta say seems kind of odd, considering that original system, like it wasn't even really a skill tree to begin with. It's more or less just kind of like this wall of icons with upgrades giving incremental percentage improvements to your various stats and abilities. More like a series of passive improvements as opposed to actual skills. But now it actually feels like I'm making a proper build. I'm putting points into shotguns, pistols, or SMGs. <laughs> And there's a tangible benefit to stick into one over the other, as opposed to just being this jack of all trades, but feeling like a master of none. You can see this best with the way that the melee combat skills have been overhauled, especially with bladed weapons like katanas, and putting a few points into this category alone completely opens up your options. One of the best new things they added in here is that you can use bladed weapons to deflect bullets, simply by just holding down the block button, which is just so fucking awesome that it's worth playing the update just to experience this alone. There's another skill point you can spend there as well, which unlocks melee finishes, and also increases the distance you can activate these from, kind of like the glory kills in Doom Eternal and zipping from enemy to enemy, finishing them off with these brutal decapitations, or just running them through with your blade is peak edgelord material. So yeah, dog, finally I can live out my fantasy of being able to play as the female Grey Fox from Metal Gear Solid, cutting down criminals in a futuristic dystopia. Got to the point where I just instigate fights with random, so I had an excuse to mess around with the combat. And I really like too how when you drive motorbikes and equip the katana, how V's gonna hold it to the side while you're riding. You know, like you're a samurai riding horseback or something. I won't act like the combat is entirely perfect though, and yeah, it is absolutely still jank city at times, almost frustratingly so. But again, finally adding in another feature that really should have been there at launch is still a massive win. And something that I spent a lot of time messing around with either way. <laughs> Having said that though, I always try to play a stealthy character in these kind of games, just with a backup master's degree in combat skills, so if I do get detected, it's more unlucky for whoever saw me as opposed to me personally. 
And Cyberpunk still got that really intuitive stealth system as well, which is really easy to understand, based primarily off line of sight. Being able to shut down security cameras with your cyberware or interacting with the environment to distract the enemies so you can make them look the other way takes what's often a half fast mechanic in most RPGs and makes it feel much more fleshed out. So it's more than just holding down the crouch button and hoping for the best. You can totally play this thing as Sam Fisher if you want to, sneaking around and choking people out from behind, or you can run in the front door like another psychopath with a shotgun or a katana, murdering everyone in sight. It's the kind of shit that really puts the RP back into RPG, and it's part of what makes this update so addictive. Hmm? Phantom Liberty also adds in a few new tricks as well with the relics. Collectible upgrades hidden around this new area which offer up new combat abilities. Like being able to pop a cloak and hide from sight to break out of combat which becomes highly useful during heavy firefights. And also being able to target an enemy's weak spot during combat which sends out a shockwave when it's hit. CD Projekt Red recommended that people start a new character from scratch to experience all these new changes, which I didn't do. I instead loaded in my level 45 character, and then I just spent like an hour or so experimenting with all these new builds. But even with that many skill points to invest, I still felt like I'd barely scratched the surface of what was possible. Perfect. Everything. Down to the last minute details. Visually, Cyberpunk was already a pretty damn good looking game to begin with, but now playing it with all the new ray tracing stuff they've added in, along with that Black Magic DLSS3 feature, it really does take it to the next level. I feel like graphics have really kind of stagnated in recent years, with most AAA games always looking good, if not great, regardless, and it's always been those more subtle things that impress me the most. Like being able to have real time reflections on your car when driving, the way that sunlight realistically catches through trees, for instance, or the way that it's filtered through, you know, smoke and dust, and neon lights, lots and lots of neon lights. I mean, what the hell are we doing in 2077 if we don't add these things up on walls every five seconds? Plus, I'm just again really impressed by how much NPC activity there is here. Even just people put into the game for little more than window dressing, they do their part in filling out all the empty holes. Empty holes? Is there a your mum joke there or something? What a life, huh? I mean, they still do little more than just get into the fetal position if you ever start causing too much carnage, but it's come a damn long way from where it used to be. Playing through Cyberpunk on launch was the biggest workout my screenshot buttons ever had, and it definitely got put to the test again here with this new update and all those new areas in Phantom Liberty. I mean, if you find yourself standing still for 30 seconds, looking off at the vista in the distance, just quietly admiring how amazing the whole thing looks, well, then you know the developers have done something right. I just built a new PC a few months ago as well, and this is something that's going to absolutely put my PC to the test, which it does. But I was still able to hit solid frames, even when running the game more or less completely maxed out, and even during heavy combat. By far though, where Cyberpunk really shines is the animation, specifically when it comes to character modeling, and how they've just transformed bog standard RPG dialogue to somehow make it actually interesting to sit through. And you can really see the difference in the way that this game handles menial dialogue to the way that a lot of other games handle it instead. Better step back. Jesus fucking Christ! I mean, let's take Starfield for instance, right? A game which I've actually liked, much to my own detriment. <laughs> But my point is, in that game, when you talk to someone, regardless of what the subject matter is actually about, it's often just a talking body locked into one position. All right. I mean, if the conversation goes south, they might raise an eyebrow. And if they end up getting really pissed off about something, well, they might, you know, become a little bit more aggressive in temperament. But they were always just mostly these basic, you know, static kind of conversations. Really? Huh. Even CDPR's earlier title, The Witcher 3, was the same kind of thing. People would just stand around more or less in one position like it was a stage play and spout off all of this exposition. Mm, you're pricklier than I remembered. In Cyberpunk though, characters walk around and they interact with the environment. They lean on benches, they sit on chairs, or they pick up objects and props. For one scene, what you got with a character in a bar, she's pouring shots of whiskey and leaning over the counter. You're having a full-on D&M at one point, and her actions kind of reflect it, as she tries to drown her sorrows while interacting with the player. Thanks, V. Really. I tell you what, though, folks, that's bloody nice. That is really... 
Later on, she even gets up and starts dancing, which is about as cringe as dancing in video games is always going to be. Don't do this often, I'm guessing. But at least it's something more than just being glued to the same spot on the floor for five minutes. Say something someone agrees with during a conversation, and you'll even see them react accordingly as well. Same as the lady. Bourbon coming up and choosing to intimidate someone during dialogue will actually have V intimidating them by often using your fist to reduce the integrity of their facial structure. Dog, fucking psycho! Just the small details like this that make the dialogue much more believable, unless about just standing around waiting for the whole thing to finish so you can move on to that next big thing. Hey, don't look at me. Wasn't there. And you truly do see all of this stuff really coming to a head during the whole Phantom Liberty questline. Gonna take more than one sig to process that. Now, Phantom Liberty is described as a spy thriller expansion where you're now stuck in the deadliest part of Night City with a mission to save the president, Rosalind Myers. Stories that you hide by a woman named Songbird to head off into this brand new sectioned off area called Dogtown. And Songbird apparently has her own way of curing the whole Johnny Silverhand thing that V's got going on inside their head. But before she'll scratch your back, you've got to scratch hers. Fine. No clue what I'm stepping into, but no risk, no reward. The problem is, is Dogtown is ruled over by a dude named Kurt Hansen, not to be confused with the beloved 90s rock band. And he's the leader of a separate military faction who's turned Dogtown into his base of operations for all these criminal activities, along with taking on Songbird as his own employee, apparently. The air is split up between the slums and lowly dwellings on the ground, and then the higher up protected communities where all the rich and successful people live. And with Hansen's militia keeping the peace, it's a society that's more or less set in stone. Which is probably why the government's just basically given up on it or tried to do anything to fix it and walled the place off instead, preventing people from going in or out. Now you can start the whole thing off with an existing character or if you want, create an entirely new one and then fast track it to level 15, which is an awesome idea. Either way though, during the opening of the DLC, you'll sneak inside with Songbird's help, just in time to see the president's plane shot down, and then have to reach the crash site and rescue her before she's killed, which is about as close as a video game's ever gotten to escape from New York. <sighs> and for the first hour or so, things are kind of linear. You even team up with President Myers for a little bit here, who's pretty damn good at holding her own against all these incoming threats. Great, let's delta. <laughs> There's a really awesome sequence where you're taking on these attacking soldiers with a hacked combat droid which eventually turns on V and Myers and has to be put out commission manually. But then after you find a good place to lay low is when it really opens up, with Dogtown becoming this new sort of hub where you can explore the area freely and take on all of these new side and main missions. The side missions are a bunch of new gigs for returning character Mr. Hands, with there being maybe 10 or so in total. Put a sock in it, dumbass. Along with having to steal a bunch of cars and deliver them to random locations around Night City, which are a bunch of missions which seem to be infinitely repeatable. Thanks for the help, V. Then there's also all these randomized airdrops throughout Dogtown as well, which are events where you can salvage containers full of high quality loot. You know, after you've fought off all the other factions that are trying to collect it as well. <laughs> The main missions, on the other hand, though, involve meeting up with some of Maya's former contacts, a woman named Alex, and more importantly, Agent Solomon Reed, whose voice and likeness is provided by Idris Elba. It's never that simple, V. And I can't remember when exactly this dude became as popular as he is now. I don't know if it was from The Wire, Luther, or Prometheus, but I'll be damned if he isn't charismatic as fuck in this DLC, and absolutely earning that goddamn paycheck. Yeah, same here. As soon as you meet him in game, there's just something about the way this character carries himself and learning about the reasons why he's holed up in Dogtown, not to mention his history with the president and his former colleagues forms a pretty big component to the overall campaign. To say that these guys are all involved in some shady shit is a bit of an understatement and it seems every time you finally figure out what's going on, new details come to light and start to make you question who you can actually trust. Because although the early objective is to find Songbird, who vanished early on during the prologue, even that goes in about 10 different fucking directions. What the fuck do we do now? I don't want to say too much more than that, because the whole thing is pretty damn plot intensive, and making up your own decisions on who to trust, part of what makes the whole thing fun to play through. Alright my people, we gotta close up for the day. I will say though that you are going to have to make some tough decisions along the way. You know, more than just choosing whether or not to put on white or black socks. 
and it does become very clear when you're hitting those massive forks in the road. Gonna have to find another way. To say that you've got heaps of options here really does make it sound like I'm underselling the whole thing. And even from the prologue, you can make decisions on whether or not characters live or die. Like these two jokers who happen to walk in on your little safe house. I mean, you can either outright kill them or use the gift of the gab to get them on your side. Do you plan to slit these two gentlemen's throats? Rest easy, Chum. I love the fact too that you can outright fail certain missions if you make the wrong dialogue choices or approach it from the right angle. Do I look like a fucking nun to you? If he's sick, take him to a clinic. I get the fuck off my property. So yeah, if the 2.0 update is a giant three-year-old birthday cake, well, then Phantom Liberty is the frosting and the sprinkles. Having said that though, while this does have a whole heap of new missions and content, not all of it is entirely memorable. In between these main key missions, you're more or less just told to go off and pass the time until the next series of events kicks in. With the plan there obviously being for the player to go off and explore Dogtown in the meantime. And I mean, look, that's fine. It encourages venturing out and seeing this new area, but it's also pretty obviously just meant to be blatant filler and a means to pad out the overall length of this new campaign. One mission has you sneaking into a party run by Hansen inside a casino at the top of this super tall megastructure, and it's this humongous area full of NPCs that's brimming with activity which really does look stunning. I mean there's even this whole musical number they've worked into it as well which is genuinely impressive to watch. but then you really just spend most of the time here talking to different characters. And again, kind of killing time until the game's ready to let you move onward. It just kind of seems like a bit of a shame that they couldn't use this area to greater effect for some kind of over-the-top action sequence, you know, given the spectacle of how cool it all looks. Didn't have shit like this in my day. Phantom Liberty also seems to have a real affinity for boss fights, with there being a whole heap of new ones added in here as well. And look man, I appreciate the effort, but I don't think these boss fights are really all that good. I'm sure there's some kind of strategy I could use to beat these guys a lot quicker, but most of it was just about whittling their health down over time and just, you know, not getting hit. It's not really challenging, it's more just like a battle of attrition than it was strategy and wits. I don't know, at least for me anyway. And then finally, I am a little bit disappointed there's no one I can have sex with in this new DLC. Yeah, I said it. I mean, look man, I created a horny corpo bad bitch on purpose, so I could sleep my way across Night City, and I'm very upset that there's no one new I can add to my body count. Given the almost aggressive sexuality of a recent game like Baldur's Gate 3, not giving the player like another half dozen different people to bang in Phantom Liberty, I don't know man, it seems like a waste. Fine, fine, whatever, just stop! If nothing else, at least we've always got mods for that. Either way though, abstinence aside, this is without a doubt the best that Cyberpunk 2077 has ever been. I know. And clearly the state that it should have been released in all those years ago. Welcome, welcome to the only net running store you need! And the sheer amount of content to get through just in the base game, never mind Dogtown, is easily going to keep people busy for the weeks and months to come. I actually went into the DLC thinking that I'd maybe play it for like 10 or so hours just to check out all the new stuff they've added in, but then the next thing I knew, another 20 hours of my life was already gone. CDPR might have had a bit of a rocky start with this, but it's safe to say that they fully turned things around. And if you somehow haven't played the base game at this point, well, there really is no reason to not have experienced it. Because it's almost at the point where it's as polished and defining as it really always should have been. I'm just happy that that dope samurai jacket that I got at E3 might finally be trendy enough to actually be seen in public with. Give it a take! Rusting piss, shit button! 